Hello again, everyone. Recently on my channel, I uploaded a video where I gave you guys a high level look at my home lab. It's a hobby of mine that I've been enjoying for many years now. And you know what? I didn't know that there'd be such a demand for more content on this. You guys seem to really enjoy this idea quite a bit. And that feels great because anytime one of your hobbies is something that other people enjoy as well, that just feels pretty good. And if you guys like it as much as I do, well, why not create more content about Home Lab and, you know, maybe I'll just kind of see where this goes. And for those of you that don't know, for those of you that haven't seen that video, Home Lab refers to the concept of running your own servers. If you're curious what some of the reasons might be for why you might want to do something like that, go ahead and check out that video if you haven't already seen it. Now, in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my home lab and expand on a few of the components and hopefully answer as many of your questions as I can. I'm not going to pretend to claim that I'm going to answer all of your questions because there's quite a few, but I'm going to go ahead and knock out as many as I can. I'm going to basically show you in this video a little bit higher in detail of how everything is laid out. Now, before we get into that, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention straight off the bat. You know, you guys have said many times in the comments that you would like me to do a series on Home Lab. I just want to say, yes, that's happening. So, um, you know, you guys want it, you'll get it. I would love to create that content and I plan on it. The tentative working title is How to Home Lab, although, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to call it. And I also submitted for a talk at PenguaCon this year in Southfield, Michigan to do a panel on Home Lab among like three other panels that I decided to do. I haven't been approved for this just yet. I'm waiting for final confirmation, but go ahead and check out the schedule for PenguaCon 2020 and you can look at the schedule and see which of those talks I'll end up doing. But if nothing else, you'll get a home lab series here on my channel. I just wanted you guys to know that yes, I will do that. Right now I'm working on a CentOS series and then I'm going to work on a Debian series and then I have another one planned, but I'm actually going to do the home lab videos kind of somewhere in the middle. It's not going to take that long. I don't know quite where it's going to fall in. I think that it's going to happen probably sometime this coming spring, so it won't take long at all. Now, before we get back into home lab, I just want to mention one last thing. I promise this is the last thing. I just wanted to send a thank you to all of my patrons that have supported me on Patreon. And I wanted to let you know that I'm looking into a way to get you guys my content first. I don't know how early you'll get it. Maybe it'll be a few days. It could be a week. I'm just working out the details. So I should have more information about that in the future. But definitely check out my Patreon page because, you know, you, you guys, it's your support that helps me make this content. I really appreciate each and every single one of you. Whether you're a patron or not, you guys are awesome. So let's go ahead and dive into my home lab and I'll give you some more detail. So here's something that I bet you guys have never seen on my channel before. I thought I would create a presentation of just a few slides to give you guys basically a diagram of what my home lab looks like from a design standpoint. So you can see basically how things are put together. I know presentations are boring. I promise this is only a few slides. So this will probably help you guys that have asked how things are interconnected understand exactly how I set everything up. Now this general network layout diagram right here does not include everything on my home network, but these are the components that I'm going to talk about in this video, and there's uh, actually going to be a few more slides, some more things to talk about, but this is a good start. So first of all, right here, we have the internet, which is the greatest thing that humankind has ever invented, and also the worst thing that humankind has ever invented all in one, depending on the context. But regardless, it's here. This is the starting point. And then here we have my cable modem. I'm not going to get into that because it's just a boring standard cable modem. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. 
But where things start to get interesting is right here at the firewall level. And for those of you that don't already know, PFSense is a router and firewall and several other things all rolled into one. It gives you all the common options that you would expect to find in a router that you would buy at a retail store, but the difference is it doesn't suck. It's enterprise quality and it's awesome. What I like most about it is that it gives you more options than any other router slash firewall operating system that I've ever used. And I'm a control freak, so that's right up my alley. And then moving on from there, you'll see that I have several UniFi devices here. I have a UniFi 8 port switch. That is what my PFSense device connects into. And coming off this switch, there's two Ethernet cables, each going to one UniFi access point. I drew just one here, but there's two. And these access points are at different places in my house. So wherever I am, I have very good coverage. And then we also have a cable that goes to yet another UniFi switch. This is the server rack right here. This UniFi 24 port switch is on that rack. You've probably seen it in the previous video that I uploaded where I showed that actual rack. That switch is right there on that rack. And then everything you see below here is all connected to this switch. For storage, I have FreeNAS, which like PFSense is BSD based. It's running on a PowerEdge R710. And I love FreeNAS because, you know, it like PFSense, it just gives you a ton of options. So FreeNAS is to storage as PFSense is to networking. It's basically great for control freaks. Another benefit of FreeNAS is that its ZFS implementation is awesome. It's probably the best implementation of ZFS I've personally used. And I think that's great because ZFS is a godsend for storage. I love it. Also connected on this rack are two Proxmox servers. They are in a cluster. They are both running on a PowerEdge R610, so I have two of these. And if you didn't already know, Proxmox is a Debian-based virtualization software similar to VMware and XCPNG. It's personally my favorite choice for virtualization. Then I also have on this rack a PowerEdge T410. It's basically my test slash play server when I want to install a distribution for, you know, basically a server purpose or just play around with something random that I basically just put it on this server. Now, obviously I can create a virtual machine and use that as my play server, but this server here has 64 gigs of RAM like my other two servers here. So if I want to run something more higher end, that needs a lot more RAM, like OpenStack, for example, if I wanted to play with that, then I would do so on this server right here because it has a lot of cores and a lot of memory. So this server basically stays powered off most of the time, but once or twice a month, I'll power it on and install something on it and test it out. And then here I have my Raspberry Pi cluster. I probably shouldn't have named it cluster. There is a cluster that's installed on it. It's a cloudlet case, and I did show this in a couple of my videos. And what that is, is a case that allows you to slot seven Raspberry Pis, and you can use each Raspberry Pi for whatever purpose you'd like. In my case, four of them are associated with Kubernetes. I have a master and three worker nodes, but then I also have some other uh, you know, Raspberry Pis on there that are not part of Kubernetes that are doing other things, which I'll talk about in a moment. But basically what I'm doing is I'm testing to see how much of this I can run in a Raspberry Pi cluster. It's a challenge for myself to see if I can replace my entire rack with nothing but Raspberry Pis. That experiment is ongoing. I don't know whether or not it's going to be successful. I just thought it would be fun. And on my channel, I have already uploaded a video or I will upload depending on the order I upload my videos in a video that shows how to set up your own Kubernetes cluster on Raspberry Pi, just like I did, if you want to go ahead and try out this experiment along with me. So next, I want to talk about SyncThing. SyncThing is my favorite file synchronization utility. 
I have it installed on everything. And yes, I will be showing you guys these things. I'll actually log into these applications and show them to you. I just wanted to show you my overall layout because maybe this might inspire you. Now, I use SyncThing in what I think is an interesting way. So a lot of people will install SyncThing on every device. Well, I did. I also have it on every device. But what they'll do is they'll have every device syncing to every device. That's not how I like to do it, though. Now here we have my FreeNAS server, my PowerEdge R710 that I spoke about in the previous slide. And on this server is SyncThing. Basically, FreeNAS has plugins, so SyncThing is installed as a plugin, which is essentially a jail. If you have used FreeNAS, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you haven't used FreeNAS yet, then just think of SyncThing in FreeNAS as a plugin because that's essentially what it is. So what I have here is that my free NAS server is in the center of everything. So let's just say, for example, I'm on my desktop right here. And I go ahead and I save a file into one of the synchronized folders on this desktop. What happens is this desktop will synchronize with free NAS just one to one. So this file will go down here and then be copied to free NAS. And then that same file will then go to my ThinkPad my Galago Pro, I have other laptops as well. I, I didn't feel like I needed to put them all on here. So I think you would think of this like a star topology or spoke or something like that. But basically you have FreeNAS here at the center and everything is syncing to FreeNAS. Notice that this desktop is not syncing with this laptop. This laptop is not syncing with this one. Everybody synchronizes first to FreeNAS and then FreeNAS will distribute that file around. I just feel like that is such a great way to do it. It's worked very, very well for me. So I'll change a file here on my laptop. It goes to FreeNAS, which, you know, is SyncThing. So SyncThing grabs that file and then SyncThing copies it over to any other nodes. Now SyncThing is one of those applications that you can use in very clever ways. Now here I have three RetroPies. I've done videos on RetroPie. I am a huge gamer. In my home lab video, you guys have spotted the Sega Dreamcast that I have in my server room, which is actually one of four Sega Dreamcasts in my house. I actually have 21 video game systems in my house, and that's not counting duplicates, so 21 different individual game systems because I'm a collector. I actually have 800 physical games in my collection so far, and that's why I'm crazy about RetroPie, because it allows me to enjoy my collection all in one place. I have a RetroPie on my living room TV, I have one in the bedroom, and then I have one in the office as well. And for those of you that don't know, RetroPie is a Linux distribution that is custom tailored to giving you the ability to play your retro games or ROMs and build a device you can, for example, hook up to a TV. Now, the reason why these are on here, and you probably already know where I'm going with this, is that if I add a ROM to the RetroPie synced folder on SyncThing, then that same ROM will be copied to all my RetroPies. I only need to make the change on one, so I can add the ROM here, and then it goes to SyncThing, and then SyncThing will send it to this one and also this one. So the ROMs actually stay in sync between the three, but that's not all. I have a customization where the save file directory is in a unique custom directory that is also under the influence of SyncThing. So I can play, for example, Super Mario World in the living room, save my game. That save file goes here to SyncThing, and SyncThing puts that save file on my other two, so I could go into my office, maybe I'm waiting for a video to render and that's freaking boring. So I'll play Super Mario World again, and that same save file is now here, and I can continue exactly where I left off. So having RetroPies sync to each other, actually sync via sync thing, means that they all have the same games and the same save files, which is just awesome. I don't have to worry about which one I was last playing on because they, they basically are all the same. And then finally, I have right here, Backblaze Offsite Backup. So if this thing just dies on me, which you know, that could happen, it's IT, these things break. It's also syncing my sync thing, synced folders 
offsite to Backblaze B2 as well. I also have like internal backup hard drives as well. I'm not mentioning I have backups of backups of backups, but I also have Backblaze B2 offsite and FreeNAS takes care of that for me as well. And even my YouTube files, basically after I upload a video, I'll put the master files and project files here on my FreeNAS. And even those are going to be backed up offsite to Backblaze so that if anything bad happens to the server, which is just a matter of when, not if, I will still have all of my files. Now, another slide I have for you guys is this one right here where I'm going to talk about my Raspberry Pi rack. And, you know, I call it a cluster as I named it right here. And yes, it kind of is because you have these nodes. These four are part of a cluster. I have an eight port switch inside this thing. And again, I showed this off in a couple of other videos. I have a dev server and each one of these are Raspberry Pi. So I have a dev server, which has, you know, some of my source code and Git files and things like that. I have a utility server, which has things like Nagios, for example, which I will show you in this video. And then I also have Home Assistant for home automation, basically controlling my light bulbs and things like that. And those are the slides that I had for you guys. I'm not much for presentations, but I thought that this would kind of show you guys exactly how I have this kind of thing set up. So I'm going to switch to a web browser now. Go ahead and open one up. So what I'm going to show you right now is SyncThing. So I'm going to navigate to syncthing.home-network.io port and then 8384. I'll go ahead and log in here. And in case you were thinking of asking in the comments, yes, I did register home-network.io. That is not a local domain. I actually own that. I registered home-network.io for my home network. I'm actually shocked that I was even able to register that and it wasn't even taken already. But anyway, you can see some of the synced folders that I have here. Again, sync thing is the tool that I use to synchronize files from one computer to another. And if I scroll down here, you can see all of the computers that I actually sync files to. So I have, you know, some laptops. So this is a laptop. Here's a laptop. You'll see Final Fantasy VI Esper names. I, I just love doing that. You know, here's another one. Uh, for example, Phantom is an Esper, Maduin, Kieran. If you played Final Fantasy VI, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. So those are all computers, but you can also see the RetroPie units here. I, I call the one in my office, uh, actually I have two of them in my office, RetroPie PC is an x86 version. Then I have a standard RetroPie, the one in the living room, the one in the bedroom, and then I also have RetroBoy, which is a handheld RetroPie. And these all sync the save files between each other and the ROMs as well. So if you add something to one, it's added to all of them with the exception being RetroBoy, because that's a Raspberry Pi Zero, which can't really handle high-end games. So I, you know, omit some of the ROMs on that one, but the uh, ROMs otherwise are copied to everything. Here you have Thelio, that's my desktop. I actually was given that during a System76 fan event, which was awesome. Super lucky to have it. I also have Videomatic, which is the server I use to render my videos that's actually on my Proxmox stack. So I could basically go on Videomatic and log in and just open Caden Live and hit the render button because all of my files, so basically if I scroll up here in my projects folder, I have all of my YouTube raw video recordings in there. And that folder is synchronized over to Videomatic, so all of my footage is there. I basically edit the video on my desktop, but I don't render it. I just save the project file and close it. And then since that project file is in my projects folder, it gets synced over to here. And then I log into this and I let this server do the rendering for me so that my desktop isn't tied up doing a render job. It just basically keeps my desktop free because Caden Live, although I love it, it's a great utility for rendering video. It's just a resource hog and it makes your computer practically unusable while you're rendering a video. At least if I'm rendering the video on a server, I don't have to worry about that. So next I'm going to go to my file server. 
which again is FreeNAS. So I will log in with the username root, and that's just the username they want you to use. I don't like it, but it is what it is. Go ahead and log in there. And FreeNAS is, like I mentioned, my favorite NAS operating system. Again, I love the flexibility and the customization you get with this, but the downside is that there is a lot of overhead. You do have to manage this. It's not quite as easy as something like Open Media Vault, but it is a great system. And if you are okay with having to customize a few things here and there, you'll probably love it too. So there's probably not a whole lot to show here. I mean, I have, you know, 18 gigs of RAM, basically. You can see I have 1.24 Tibby bytes free on my main volume one, which is the only volume that I have. And if I go down here to plugins, and they have actually changed the user interface quite a bit here. I only have one. So you can see I have sync thing, the font color is kind of hard to see. So when I go here to sync thing, and I'm on this plugin right here, this is local, it's actually right here. This is where sync thing lives. So when I go here to sync thing, I am actually going to this plugin right here. That's how I have that set up. And then if I go over here to storage and then I show the pools, you can see the data sets that I have and how those are broken down. We have again, volume one, which is my main storage, actually the only storage. Underneath that, I have an archive, things that I don't use. Those files in here basically get shipped off to Backblaze and then removed. So this size will actually fluctuate here. I have a backup data set. Here I have a data set for Clonezilla. If I want to take an image of one of my computers, that's where it gets stored. Now home is in its own data set as well. I have my home directory on there. IO cage is basically where the jails go. Media, I have my music right here. And then I have videos. So I have about 97 Gibby bytes of music. And then for videos, I have about 1.3 Tibby bytes or something like that. So I have quite a lot of videos. This is where Plex actually gets the video content from is this data store right here. Proxmox, again, that's my virtualization software. I have a backup directory right here, which is where Proxmox sends the backups of the virtual machines. I have an ISO directory, which as you could probably guess is where the ISO images are stored for installing various Linux distributions, scripts. And right here I have SyncThing, which is its own data set. And this is the data set that is given to the SyncThing plugin. I have 227 Gibby bytes of data in there. Most of that is probably going to be the raw footage for video files that I haven't finished editing yet. The YouTube data store here is basically where I save and archive my project files. And then also the final versions of videos that I upload to YouTube get stored in this folder right here. And I've archived most of these, which is why you don't see a whole lot of data right here. There's actually a heck of a lot more than that in Backblaze, and I also have a YouTube archive. So basically things will get moved from here to the archive and then eventually age out as it gets uploaded over to Backblaze. Now it's time for Proxmox. So I'll go to VM host one. Actually, I need HTTPS, I keep forgetting that. Here we go, so I'll go ahead and log in and I'll click the login button. And now we are here on my Proxmox setup. I'm gonna go ahead and make the font size a bit larger for you. And that way you should be able to see it better. So I showed this off a little bit in my previous video. I have two hypervisors right here. I have VM host one, and then I have VM host two. VM host one has most of these VMs right now. I can actually move these from one server to the other. So if I wanted to update VM host one, I can actually migrate all of these VMs to the second one, upgrade this, reboot it, and then move them all back, upgrade the second one and reboot that one. That's basically why you want a cluster. I have a couple of uh, containers. I only have one running right now. And that's how you can tell this little icon right here is a container icon, then we have what looks like a computer monitor. These are VMs. 
And someone asked me why I don't use containers more often because I could get a lot more out of my hardware if I use containers. That is true. I definitely could get a lot more out of my hardware if I use containers. The problem with containers is that if you try to migrate it to another node, it has to shut it down, then it copies it over to the other node. So it would go over here, and then after it's copied, it would start it back up again. But if it's a VM, you could basically live migrate while it's still on, and then you don't have to worry about like the app going down while you're waiting. Now, another thing that I wanna show you guys is my utility server. The utility server is a Raspberry Pi. It runs several different networking utilities. So I'll just type utility.homenetwork.io slash Nagios, enter. I'll put in my super secret password here. And then you can see my monitoring system. So Nagios alerts me if there's anything wrong with my network or any of the devices on my network. So if I go to hosts, you can see all of these servers that I have and all the various things. I even have my security cameras on here. So if my security cameras go down, I get an alert. AWX is for Ansible. So that's something I'm playing around with. You know, there's my dev server. I have my website, which, um, you know, I have several different checks for various websites that I have. I have a check for my PFSense. You see my Kubernetes nodes in master right here, my Minecraft servers. I scroll down, I have a number of smart plugs and you know, even the lizards and my turtles. Yes, I have turtles. So if I scroll down, you see, I have a smart plug for my turtle tanks and everything, you know, everything is on the network, even my turtle tanks, because it monitors the power that it uses and controls the filters and the lighting, which is the same thing that happens with the lizard tanks as well. So even my pets stuff is on the network. I'm not even kidding you. And I, I like to mod, you know monitor everything. I have my Unify access points on here. So if someone in my house is saying, hey, I can't connect to the internet, then I'm basically, basically like, yes, I know. I know it's down. I got the alert. Because you don't need Wi-Fi for these alerts to work. This is wired in. And it wired it's wired in right straight down to the cable modem. So it's able to send an alert to my phone if uh, Nagios doesn't detect that the access points are on. And same with the switches, which... Actually, if the right switch is down, I guess that alert couldn't actually go through, but you get the idea. And then for individual services, I basically monitor just about everything from SSH access, the memory being free, free space for the hard drive or virtual hard drive. If home is on its own partition, it's there. Um, and if I scroll down, See if there's anything interesting here. There's my Jenkins server, my Kubernetes, or I keep saying Kubernetes. I should say Kubernetes. It's hard. And my Minecraft servers, I have two. There's Plex, which Plex is great for movies. And Plex, actually, you get the idea. This is for monitoring. Plex is something that I definitely should talk about because, you know, that's basically how I can get access to my movie collection. So if I go ahead and go into plex.tv and I'll go ahead and sign in. And now that I'm logged in, I'm not gonna enable DRM because um, I'm not actually going to play anything. But basically here is my Plex server. This is my actual Plex server. So you can see some of the things that I'm into by looking at this, of course, Doctor Who and Orphan Black, you know, definitely some great things and some movies, of course. So Plex is a very awesome way of sharing your media collection or just making it available when you are away from home. And the way that works, I'll go ahead and open up a terminal here. Actually, I already had one open here. So I'll just go ahead and go into Plex. Now, what I wanna show you guys is how this is actually managed. So if I do df-h, you can see that the local file system here, the root file system is only 16 gigabytes. You really can't store very many movies on that, can you? But what you'll actually see right here is that I have an NFS mount where the videos are actually stored and it's mounted here to NFS Plex as you see here. So if I go back to the browser and back to VM host one, here is the actual Plex server right here. If I go to hardware, 
you'll see that it has, a, like I mentioned, a 16 gig hard drive. That's it. I mean, that's all it has. So I could literally delete this server right now and none of my videos go away because they're not even stored on the server at all. They are stored on FreeNAS and then we actually have the uh, media data store or data set right here and then videos that's where it's mounting that from so that's where it's actually um, getting that from now what's interesting is that this uses something called auto fs so basically if i look at the config file auto master i mean it's basically just setting the paths right here nothing too much value there, but if I do cat and then etsy auto.nfs, we can see the actual line that mounts the network share for my videos. And why this is important is because this is only mounted when it's in use. So let that sink in for a minute. When this server boots up, this is not mounted. If I so much as do an ls against the directory that this mounts to, the autofs daemon will automatically right then and there mount it on the spot and then after some time it'll time out it'll drop the nfs mount that's great because you don't have to worry as much about nfs locking because it's only mounted when it's in use so if i go to play a movie then it'll actually mount it right then and there and start playing and plex is stupid it doesn't even realize that it's not mounted all the time because anytime plex itself goes to check on the status of this mount it'll automatically mount it so that the status check will go through so that just makes it a lot smarter auto fs is actually a little kind of annoying to be completely honest with you um, after you get through some of its quirks, kind of hard to explain. But once you get through the quirks, it's actually great. So as soon as this VM boots up and Plex goes and checks and does an index of the media, AutoFS will intercept that I.O. request or basically whatever word I'm supposed to use for that. And then just mount that directory to allow Plex to do whatever it needs to do. And it happens so fast that Plex doesn't even know that it wasn't mounted in the first place. All right, so basically that's Plex. Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, at least I think it's the last thing because I know I do wanna to try to see if I can answer some additional questions that you guys might have, is Ansible because a lot of you guys have asked about Ansible. Yes, I will do an Ansible series at some point. I'm thinking at this point it's probably going to be this coming summer. I just have some backlog I need to get through first. But you'll notice I don't actually have an Ansible server. Yes, AWX is technically an Ansible server, but this is not in use. There actually is no Ansible server at all. Now, most people that deploy Ansible, they have an Ansible server, but I use something called Ansible Pull. So I'm going to open a new tab here. I'm going to see if I can find this article. Ah, here it is. This is an article that I wrote some time ago, actually, you know, quite a while ago actually here. This article kind of talks about how I set up Ansible because the method that I write about in this multi-part article series here on this website basically gives you a simplified version of my setup, but I use Ansible pull. So if I scroll down, let's see if it's on this first version. We have this command right here. Let me go ahead and blow this up for you. We have the ansible pull command right here. This is something that I will go over when I do get a chance to make an ansible series. But basically, I have my ansible code in a git repository. You can see a sample of that here. What ansible pull does is it downloads the ansible git repository and it runs it localhost. So any of my computers can run Ansible pull in a command very similar to this one, and it will run that against itself. So there's no server. Every laptop and desktop fetches the config from the Git repository and runs it against itself. And I don't like having an Ansible server for a few reasons. One, because it's a central point of failure. You could argue that this GitHub server represents a single point of failure, and you're right, it does. But it's a lot less likely that GitHub is going to go down than one of my own servers. 
And even if it did, every server and every laptop and desktop are each pulling down the Ansible config. And if this did go down, I can retrieve my Ansible configuration from any of my laptops or desktops, because again, they're downloading it anytime that I make a change. And I actually have an option that will only run if there actually has been changes to the Git repository. So that protects me from an Ansible job running when it doesn't actually need to. It runs by cron, and then all of my systems will check in, find out if there's any changes to the repository, run them locally, and then that basically is how they all run. If you would like to find out how I am running Ansible, then check out this article because this is exactly how I do it. It is a simplified version of how I do it, but it is the way I do it. So if you want to get started with using Ansible to manage your workstation configuration, again, check out this article. There's a few other parts in this series and you can set up Ansible exactly like I have. And then that'll give you a chance to play around with it. And that way, when I do create that Ansible series, you'll already be ahead of the game. So what actually is Ansible doing for me? So what I'm gonna do is go back to a terminal. I'm going to go into my dev server here. Let's check out the code. So I have a local copy of my Git repositories here. So I have Git and then Ansible. So I'm in the Ansible directory. And if I list the storage, I'm going to give you a high level look at how this actually works. So first of all, when you use Ansible pull, it expects to find a file named local.yml inside the repository at the root of the repository. If you don't have this, it will fail to run unless you give it an argument with a different playbook name. But why would you want to do that? Just create local.yml. It, it just makes it easier. So if I go ahead and look at that, go up here to the top, you can see some of my code here. So we have pre-tasks, which basically run before anything else. So it's going to update the package caches for the various distributions. And yes, it's checking to see, you know, is it Arch Linux? Is it Debian? Is it Ubuntu? Because I don't want to maintain multiple Ansible configurations for multiple distributions. You can actually put a win statement here. And basically this chunk of code is only executed when the Ansible distribution is, well, Debian or Ubuntu. And you have one here for Arch Linux as well. So this one Ansible repository actually handles multiple distributions. And again, this local.yml file is the first thing that's run. So think of it like an index. So if I scroll down, it's running roles. So this one here, um, which is role base, is, is being run on everything. It doesn't matter if it's a laptop, desktop, or server. The base role, I want on everything. That's my config files, my user account, all that. I want this on every single laptop, every desktop, every server, every VPS, literally everything I want this role to be run on. Now where things get a little bit custom here, actually quite a bit custom, is I have a role for workstation. And then I have a role for Raspberry Pi and then server. So I have a, a role for servers as well. So depending on what type of machine it is, I'll give it one of these roles or maybe all of them if I wanted to. And then at the very end, it's going to go ahead and just run some cleanup stuff. I'm not going to get into that. And now let's take a look at the roles. So I have a roles folder right here. And if we look at that, you can see those roles that I mentioned. So if I make a system part of the workstation role, then the scripts or playbooks inside here, actually it's within the task directory, will get run. And just take a moment and look at everything that it's doing. I have a playbook for installing Google Chrome, for my dot files, installing OpenBox, SyncThing, Thunderbird, you name it. I have pretty much a playbook for just about everything. So let's take a look at Firefox. You might be thinking, big deal, Firefox is just apt to install Firefox. Why would you need to do this? Well, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm using this play right here to remove Firefox and anything with Firefox on the name. 
So basically what this is doing is it's going to remove any package installed by the distribution that so much as has a word Firefox in it. Why would I do that? Well, because it takes time for the distribution to package Firefox and give me a new version. I don't like that because when there's security updates, I want them right now. I don't want to wait three or four days until Ubuntu you know, gets that done and gets that packaged, which to be fair, three or four days, that's actually pretty reasonable, but I'm impatient and I don't want to wait for that. I want to maintain my own Firefox, so let's just get rid of it and get that off the system. And then what it's going to do is it's going to use the unarchive play right here and the source, well, look at this, download.mozilla.org. This is going to the FTP site and grabbing that for me. It's actually going to grab the tarball from Mozilla's site. And um, what it's doing is it's downloading Firefox latest. So whatever the latest version is, that's what it's going to download. It's going to put it in slash opt. It's going to make root the owner. That's important because if my user account is the owner, then if a malicious script is running as me, and Firefox is owned by me, that script would have permission to corrupt Firefox and put malicious software in there. So I don't want that. So I make it owned by root. And then of course it runs a permissions job. And then I'll scroll down here. And I hate, 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 hate. That's the words of Kefka in Final Fantasy VI, if you get the reference. I hate, 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 hate the default bookmarks that Firefox gives you when you install a fresh Linux distribution and, or a fresh installation of Firefox. So before I even have a chance to run Firefox, uh, basically it's going to create this directory or this defaults slash profile folder right here. If this is present, it's not going to add those bookmarks. So I don't have to worry about that. Then it's going to add a custom Firefox icon. And then finally, it's going to copy a Firefox desktop launcher so it shows up in my applications tray the same way it would if it actually was installed by apt. So this is completely custom. And then if we look at sync thing, and I know, you know I'm going crazy with detail here, but you guys did ask for it. Here is my sync thing task book right here. Task book, playbook, you get the idea. It's going to create all the directories here that I will end up using sync thing to sync. Then it's going to copy the st ignore file, which is a text file that includes a list of things that I do not want to be synced. And it's going to put that in all of these directories. So that'll automatically not sync the things I don't want to. It's going to add the apt key and then the apt repository. Well, it's going to do that if it's Debian or Ubuntu anyway. And then after all that's done, it's going to go ahead and install the sync thing package. Then it basically starts and enables sync thing. So you can see that right here, it's running that command. And then this is interesting, wait for. I wanna wait for something. What do I wanna wait for? I wanna wait after sync thing starts for the config.xml file to generate. Once it does, then I'm going to go ahead and change some of the configuration within that config file automatically. So for example, I'm disabling the start browser. I'm going to enable the dark theme. And then I'm going to remove that pesky sync directory that it insists on giving you because I don't ever intend on using that. I can go on, but you get the idea. Another thing that I'll show you guys here, if I go into GNOME, this is huge. This is going to do a lot. Um, so first of all, I'm going to disable the high DPI daemon. That is provided by System76 with the System76 driver and also the um, Pop! OS distribution as well. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I want this off the system. I want this disabled because, well, you know, it, I know they mean well, and it, it's a decent piece of software, but it's constantly getting in my way. There's bugs that just haven't been fixed yet, and I don't need it anyway, so let's just get that gone. And then down here, I'm going to install all the GNOME packages. So, you know, you have gedit, the backgrounds, the control center, GNOME shell, you get the idea. It's going to install all the GNOME packages for me. 
Might as well install GNOME Books while we're at it, so it's installing GNOME Books. It's going to set up some extensions. It's going to set custom key bindings. So I have a keyboard shortcut to open the terminal, to open the browser, the file manager, keyboard shortcut to open that right there. There's a terminal one. Terminal with Tmux is another keyboard shortcut. I have a keyboard shortcut to open a text editor. I have one to open KeyPass XC. HTOP for viewing system resources. I have a keyboard shortcut for just about everything. And these config lines here will add all of that to GNOME for me. So all of that is in place as soon as I install it. I have some things commented out, but basically these would allow me to change some additional things if I wanted to. I'm going to disable screen blanking, disable hot corners. I want to show the battery percentage on the top bar. I want to have trash automatically cleared in 30 days. I want my temp files to automatically clear. Disable the automatic screen lock. I want to be in control of that. Change whether or not the workspaces are only on the primary display. Show only the close icon. I don't want notifications on the lock screen, so let's get rid of that. I want in, I want to have uh, natural scrolling for the mouse. And I'll adjust the cursor speed of the mouse. I'll set the night light schedule. Scroll down further here. Set the power button behavior. I want it to automatically suspend when I'm on battery, so I'll make sure that's on there. Disable the menu bar on the terminal so we can get rid of that. I can set the terminal color scheme. I'm going to copy the wallpaper file, set the wallpaper, copy the lock screen file, set the lock screen. Make tree view the default in Nautilus. I can go on. There's so many customizations here. So what I am hoping to do at some point is to release this entire customization of Ansible to the public domain in a public repository. But there's just a few things that I'm going to need to change first. I don't think there's anything here that really matters if you guys see it. I just need to sanitize it a little bit. Might be a couple of things I'll remove, but I do want you guys to have access to this in case you wanna do something similar like I am doing here. But um, at some point I will be creating an Ansible series, so I will show you guys exactly what this looks like. So, I know that was a long video, guys, so I'm sorry, not sorry. Am I sorry? I don't think I'm sorry. I love this stuff. And you guys mentioned in the comments that you enjoyed that original video and you wanted more detail. So, you know, be careful what you ask for. You definitely got a lot of detail. I know some of those things might go over your head. I just wanted to give you an overview of everything. And in future videos, I'll go over these types of things so that you guys will know what the heck I'm even talking about in the first place. I'll do some additional home lab videos, and when I do this series on home lab, I'm going to break it down. It's going to be less about mine and more about home lab in general, how to get started, how to choose the right hardware, what applications you might want to consider running. I think I will put some of my own customizations in there. I might make tutorials for the various things that I showed off in this video at some point in the future. I literally have like 17 videos on my hard drive right now. I haven't even edited yet, but I promise I'll get to it and I'll definitely get you the guys that content. So subscribe if you haven't already done so. I have some awesome videos coming and some of them are related to this. So if you like Home Lab, keep the comments coming guys and I'll have more content in that regard very soon. And I'll see you in those videos as soon as I have them uploaded.